Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. Ladies and gentlemen, your host for the House of Hardcore podcast, Tommy Dreamer. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the House of Hardcore podcast. I'm your host, Tommy Dreamer. And this week, I got my good friend and Memphis royalty, Wolfie oh. D. How the hell are you? Memphis royalty. I love that, man. Thank you so much, man. Uh, I'm, I'm good, Tommy, man. I just got back from the doctor, had my first epidural injection into my lower back because I am effed up bro well it's because you were a bumping machine and we'll get into all that bumping machine but the first question i ask everybody what got you hooked in this wonderful world of professional wrestling bro i was uh i was about eight years old man and uh my mom met her husband that you know they they died together man and uh he was a huge wrestling fan and I don't know. It's funny. I, when I think back about this, I don't know that I had even knew wrestling existed before this. So at about eight years old, he comes into our lives and he loves wrestling. And, uh, I lived in Nashville. So what we got on Saturday mornings was Memphis TV and, uh, he would watch it and I started watching it with him. And I just immediately fell in love with it, man. Just immediately. Did you have uh, a guy? as far as like when I got in the business? Well, no, like I'm saying like my, my guy was Dusty Rose. He was my oh, you said, favorite. Uh, okay. I you he said, was. Yeah. I thought you said guide, uh, but you, you said guy. Well, there was a few, man. And I say, these people are the ones that made me want to be a wrestler. Hawk and animal, Kurt Henning, Randy Savage. Wow. But, I mean, you saw them later on. I mean, Savage was in Memphis. Uh, did you see him like first? I saw him on Memphis. That was the first time I had seen him. Yeah. And so then when he went to, to New York and everything, that was awesome to me. But it, there was a funny time because I was more of a WCW guy, man. I, I liked it a lot better because me and my my friend that was like my wrestling buddy or whatever, um, we even back then. So you, you got this is. Uh, the 80s the mid 80s early mid 80s and uh we called it selling your soul <laughs> if, if yeah. our guys went to wwf we called it selling their souls but i still liked it when you know randy went there because obviously you know the him and steamboat match and all that kind of stuff man i mean that was where he really did his shit but he was so fucking like he was even more hardcore on memphis tv and iwa you know what I mean? But yeah. he was just, he was one of a kind, man. And I don't think, honestly, you know, you hear people talk about the Mount Rushmore of wrestling and, you know, they always say flair, but man, Randy Savage deserves to be in there, I think. Yeah. You know, it, it's funny that you say that even at that age, me too, and we're, we're around the same age. I always like when a guys went to WWE, you beat like Dusty, Dusty in the polka dots, but it'd be like, no, yeah. no way, that's not the real Dusty. The real right. guy is when they were in NWA. Right. We, we were we were fans, we were marks, but it was also the NWA was presented more as a wrestling company as opposed right. to it was glitz and glamour and sports entertainment. Yeah. And then you said Dusty in the polka dots. Yeah, I hated that too. But and then also it made me think of Lawler. Lawler goes up there and he's basically a commentator and the Fucking strap means nothing when I'm accustomed to that. If Lawler is walking down a street in Memphis to this day and he pulls his strap down, the general public is going to take off running. He's going to beat up everybody <laughs> in his path. Yeah. We still believe. Um, yeah. So how do you get started in your path to become a wrestler? Because the business was is, of course, it's not like you go look up wrestling schools online. So Right, hell. right. Uh, my stepdad and a guy named Rick Reynolds uh, start. They met. My stepdad knew Lynn Rossi, 
Okay. And I'm not sure if this led into my stepdad knowing Gypsy Joe or not, but uh, my stepdad and Rick started going to a ring out in West Nashville. Uh, It was in a barn that one side of it was uncovered. The ring had no canvas, just the carpet and the ropes were um, uh, garden hoses. Okay. So (laughs) It stunk like cat piss, all right? But anyway, they start going to see Gypsy and training with Gypsy. And then I'm 15. I find out they're going. And I'm like, please take me, please. So they did. And uh, I got in there with Joe, man. And like, honestly, Dreamer, man, it's like everything he would show me, I would get it like that. And it's because, uh, you know, I watched it so much. But then you remember the forehead VCR? Mm Mm-hmm that was like a royalty back then. You know what I mean? And I watched everything in fucking slow motion, man. I I rewound and watched everything in slow motion. So anyway, I caught on pretty quick, man. And then I didn't train with him probably a month and a half or something like that before they threw me in the ring. So at 15 years old. Yep. Uh, Actually, I think by the time I got in the ring, because my birthday's in December, I started training like right at the end of the year. And I think I was in the ring uh, when my birthday turned, uh, Pearl Harbor day, December the 7th, I think I turned 16. Yeah. Wow. 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 And you're probably doing what Tracy Smothers would call outlaws. (laughs) Oh, it was, it was terrible outlaws. The, The first place I ever wrestled was Winchester, Tennessee. So you can look that up in the population and there was probably 50 people there. I had a mask on because they didn't want nobody to know that I was so young or whatever. I mean, looking back, it's like, who gives a fuck? But I don't know, that's what they thought. And so I wore a mask and I was called, you remember the show, you know, my, my real last name is Wolf. And because I was 15, uh, I played sports. I liked basketball. I could jump. So I was called air wolf. Nice. So (laughs) gypsy Joe is uh, the one who trained you tough son of a bitch. Yeah. Oh my God, man. Love him to death. He was so a lot of people, man, when I, he was my third match, believe it or not, you'd think he'd be my first one since, you know, he trained me or whatever, but he wasn't Uh, Rick. The other guy I was talking about, he was my first match, but Joe was my third. And the week before that, Joe had a beef with this guy that was running the town. Of course uh, he, did. he was. <laughs> I love so it. I watched him beat the absolute dog shit out of this dude. I'm talking about taking him out of the ring and putting him in places where, you know, if it was like, this is what we're supposed to do. You would stay out in front of the fans. He was taking him in rooms in this building where there was paint, dumping paint on him. And I'm mean, just <laughs> fucking killing this guy. So it's not, I got to work them the next week. And everybody's like, of course they marked out, you know, and it kind of was a shoot, but everybody's like, Oh fuck, you know, and me, I got to work him next week. I hope you don't get mad at me. <laughs> so, 16 but, years old. I can't even comprehend that. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Look, but I'll tell you this, man, you know, Joe was known for his chops and stuff, right? He fucking backs me in the corner. This is, you know, pretty much right off the get go. Backs me into the corner, licks his fingers. He says, don't worry, kid. And forearms me in the chest instead of chopping me. He didn't give me a chop the whole fucking match, man. Nice. He called, uh, it, it, nobody does anymore, flying head scissors. You know what I'm saying? And this yeah. time, God, man, this was, uh, like I said, 1989. I'm not, Joe died at what, 70 something, right? Mm-hmm. So you think of how old he was then. I mean, he was old then. And, uh, he was, he was working with me cause he liked me. He knew that I, uh, I, I got it. You know what I mean? Wow. Um, uh, quick story. I remember Taz wanting to go to new Japan and his first opponent. And like, he wants it through all his suplexes, all that stuff is gypsy Joe. And right. we're from New York. We have no clue who he is. And we see this picture of gypsy Joe yeah. and he looked like an old bag of dirt. <laughs> and Taz is like, bro, they put me in the ring with this old guy. Like, how's this guy going to take my suplexes? And I remember him hit, hitting me up and he's like, dude, that old man beat me up. <laughs> and he's like, I dumped him on his head and he kept telling me do it more. He loved working yes. with me. And he goes, I was hitting him as hard as I could. And then he hit me back. He broke Taz's eardrum 
And he was like, <laughs> he beat me up, bro. He's the toughest guy ever. Nothing but respect. And, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. I hit it off hitting with Joe. Him, hitting yeah. him. He's one of those dudes. I swear when you hit him, like if you chop him or whatever, it's like hitting a tree. Even at that age, man, he was just like that, man. He, he And I know you've seen the fucking uh, where him and New Jack got into it. I know you've yeah. seen that. And Dude. and like I said, Joe trained me. So and, and I like New Jack. But at the same time, I was kind of hot at Jack for it. You know what I mean? Yep. Like, Damn, here's, on, here's the deal. If you talk about tough, he got legit hit with a baseball bat with barbed wire twice. Yeah. Yeah. And got up. Yeah. He yeah. just got up and was like, yeah. walk, walk to the back. When yeah. a guy is trying to physically probably kill him. One, two, Jack stops. People are trying to break it up. Whatever happens, Joe just gets up and walks to the back. Exactly. Like, Holy crap. That was a, yeah. it was a hard watch. And then I'm like, could you imagine? Can you imagine? I, and I've said this a hundred times, man, about him. Okay. When I'm speaking this, I speak about him because, and I, and I started saying this back when he was fucking in his sixties or whatever. Can you imagine? I mean, that's like your grandpa or your yep. friend's grandpa or your girl's grandpa, whatever. Pick your grandpa up and fucking give him a body slam. Yeah. What's what's gonna happen? He's going to the ER. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then you think about stuff like what you just said, that beating he took, but just and, and I know how I feel right now at 48. Just the fucking body slam is like ow. As we get older, dude, I have moments like that. Like I'll I'll wrestle and I'll think of what Terry Funk did for us in ECW. Yeah. He's 55 doing a moonsault to the floor. Right. And I'm like, how did he feel the next day? How did he feel getting on a plane the next day? Uh, Yeah. Absolutely, man. (laughs) I wrestled him when he was in his 60s, dude. And he hit me the hardest I ever been hit. And I was just like, okay. And I'm hitting him back as hard as I can. And I, my hand is hurting. And I'm like, yeah. I, like, and it's so funny you said that. Cause I was like, I feel like I'm fighting my grandfather and I'm having a hard time fighting my grandfather. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Um, so bad grandpa. <laughs> your first break is Memphis. Yeah. yeah. How did that first feel for you for being a kid growing up, watching it to, you know, you're how old when you're you get into Memphis? Uh, 18, I think, or, or 19, maybe. Um, man, I cannot tell you, like, okay, yeah, I had a little run in WWE, I had a little run in WCW, you guys, blah blah blah. But man, Memphis, it gives me cold chills right now just saying it. Yep, being in the Mid South Coliseum. Okay, so in Nashville, when they would show Memphis wrestling, right, uh, the clips, and you know how the deal worked. It was uh, TV on Saturday, which everywhere except Memphis, it was a week later. Okay, so you had to do the loop, but you did Tuesday through Friday was what was on last week's TV. Anyway, when they would show the uh, clips from the matches, they would show the Mid-South Coliseum. You never got to see the fairgrounds, which was in Nashville. but the fairgrounds was where I went to watch it. Okay. Being in that building for the first time was probably, it, it just felt like home. It just felt that way to me, man. That was just, that was my home. And, 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 and to be able to main event it on a number of times, but also the mid South Coliseum being there, having seen that on TV uh, and, and going back into what you said, I'm going to address how, how that came to be was uh, Jeff Jarrett was on. So, so I started doing Wolfie D by myself. I was Airwolf, And then I came up with this idea kind of from Chris champion. He was doing, he was kind of like one of my mentors, man. And he was doing this like ugly kid, Joe gimmick uh, in the early, like 91, I think. And he was just doing it on the independent stuff. And me and him were good friends, man. And uh, so I developed because he was wearing shorts, a flannel, you know, the whole 90s ugly kid Joe gimmick. So then I got the idea because I was a huge 80s rap fan, NWA, Eazy-E, all that stuff, right? So I put on some shorts, I graffitied them, 
And then I was Sir Wolfie D, Sir Mix-a-Lot, my name, <laughs> and Heavy D, right? <laughs> so anyway, that's that's how that came about. Well, then Chris goes, hey, you dudes uh, should do this as a tag team. Me and Jamie were wrestling against each other on some of these Kentucky towns. That's where I met Jamie. And uh, so we did. So JC Ice, Wolfie D. And then I'm on the shitter, honestly, coming up with a name for this tag team. The Hip Hop Express, the just, I don't know. I, was, I had it wrote down in this little notebook. And if you remember, were you an NWA fan of uh, yeah. the rappers? Okay, so you remember Parental Discretion is Advised for the moment. That song was the inspiration for me to come up with PG-13. I thought, there's no tag team that has just, it, it, it's like a long word and name, not a, you know, two letters and two numbers. So anyway... I thought that was catchy. I liked it. And that's where we did that. So Jeff Jarrett is at a outlaw show um, in Beaver Dam, Kentucky. And me and Jamie wrestled Brickhouse Brown. And I can't remember whether it was Pez Watley because he was there sometimes too. Or Anyway, tag team match. And Jamie says to Jeff, because Jamie has history with Jeff. I don't know, Jeff. I just met him. Jamie has the old VCR camera. And he looks at Jeff, hands it to him, and he says, hey, man, record this match and take it to your old man. <laughs> and Jeff fucking <laughs> did it. And, and and you knowing Jeff and me knowing Jeff, that's awesome. Yes. <laughs> so Jeff stands outside the, uh, the curtain there and fucking videotapes our match. Takes it to his dad. His dad calls Jamie, I don't know, a week or so later, and we go up to the mansion. You've heard of the mansion on the hill in Hendersonville, right, where the office was. So we drive up there. We're supposed to meet at such and such a time or whatever day this was. Well, we drive up. We call him. Hey, we're out here. He says, boys, I'm sick. I, uh, I, I'm not going to be able to do it today. Fuck. <laughs> fuck, fuck, fuck. We just drove out of here. He postpones us for a week. Go back up there. We call him. Hey, Jerry, we're here. Still a little sick, but come on in. Jamie looks at me and he says, if we make him laugh, we got a job. Okay. So we walk in. We got our bags because we got our shit, you know, in the in the thing, in our bags. And uh, so we sat down there and started talking to him. He's got a big red ass nose. He's wiping his uh, with the with the, the Kleenex and whatnot. And he is sick. He says, so let me see this gimmick I've been hearing about. So me and Jamie go out of his office into this little room that's right, right off his, uh, out of his office, put our shorts on, put the whole shit on, hubcap around the neck, come out. He goes, <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I was like, he, Jamie was right. <laughs> we made him laugh and we did get a job. <laughs> so I'm popping not alone because your partner, cause I know him, uh, you know, very very well that he tells Jeff to hold the camera like yeah. bravado that is Let me ask you though, <laughs> like did at this time like his father have heat with Jerry because why wouldn't he just tell his father hey make this happen uh, he I don't think it was that I don't think it was hey make this happen he just yeah. handed it to him and, and I don't know because I've never asked Jeff right. this question uh, I just saw him the other day um he did deliver the tape, and I don't know what was said, but Jerry no, watched No, I'm not it talking and, Jeff. I'm talking I'm talking Jamie. Why didn't Jamie go to his dad, Bill? Oh, say, because Bill, man, Bill, dude, Bill was kind of blocking us, man, okay. trying to, honestly. And, and, and people will tell you, man, Bill, in those days, early 90s, in the 80s, and probably the 70s, even worse. But with age, he, you know how the guys do, man. They get older and they become, they become nicer. Even the guys that have been known for being dickheads, right? Right. So, uh, absolutely, Bill was trying to block us because he knew that we could get over. And that's the old school guy in him going, I don't want him taking my spot. You've heard the knife story. We, motherfucker pulled a knife on me once. Well, we'll tell that story later. <laughs> <laughs> So, hey there, auto mechanics and super cool do-it-yourself guys who work on their own cars. I want to tell you about rockauto.com, the online store with every auto part at the best 
prices. This is your one-stop shop for everything auto parts. RockAuto.com has been in business for 20 years and they make it easy to find parts you need at the best possible prices. No more talking to counter guys who need to order your parts, aren't really sure what you're looking for. And then after all that hassle, they will still charge you storefront markups. At RockAuto.com, you can easily find everything you need. And whether you're a mechanic, an auto shop, or working on your own car, Everyone has access to the same incredible pricing at rockauto.com. So if you're a car guy right now, go to rockauto.com and check out all the parts available for your car. You're going to have so much fun looking at car parts. So once more, go to rockauto.com. No promo code needed as their pricing is already that good. When you order, make sure you tell rockauto.com that you heard about them here on the House of Hardcore podcast. rockauto.com. Let's get back into it. Okay, so now you get the ball going and for those of you listening i don't know if you ever seen pg-13 beyond entertaining uh ecw was a different mix uh same with wcw but the, i mean the real like we're talking about the real wrestling is you guys in memphis uh you yeah. know this is wrestlers angles that is now going to feed themselves feed their families you have to ha- have good wrestling great angles so the houses are up so you make your money and, and you make uh, a you, weekly paycheck. It's just like a real job. And but you guys, <laughs> and you guys did it. And some of your stuff is ahead of its time. Uh, also Thank controversial. You. But I mean, I knew about you guys, and I wasn't getting Memphis Television then. But it was always this buzz, and you, you talk about that look. You know, I remember the first time meeting Jamie, and like that look. He didn't have a good body. He was short, <laughs> but like. What, looking at those pictures, you think this guy's a tough, badass, you know, dude. Right. right. And not saying he isn't, but it was just like, then you meet him. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, you meet yeah, him, yeah. And you like him even more just because he's Jamie. Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, it, it's just, you guys did a lot. What was your, do you have like a favorite moment or a favorite angle like throughout your career in Memphis? Um, it, let me, because while you were talking, and saying those things, it reminded me of something you said to me that uh, has always stuck in my head. And like, I really appreciated it is uh, you, you came up to me and Jamie and I can't remember like when we first came in or, or whatever, I don't remember what time period it was when we were up there, but you came to me and you said, or to us, and you said, you know what, man, out of everybody on the roster, you guys look like wrestlers. And I just, I took that in, man. And I really appreciated that. And I, if I've never told you, thank you. Thank no, you. That I never was did. That is cool. a very nice comment. Um, okay. So back to that. What what was the actual question? When, when you just have a, a, well, I'm even looking at you now. You look oh, like the favorite, the favorite. What I'm saying b- b- besides that too, that comes because you guys working the towns, working seven days a week, <laughs> You're not just going to be wrestling in sweatpants and all. Like, even now I'm looking at you. You're almost 50 years old. You look like you're somebody. You got the bald head. You got glasses. You got the tat. You look like you're a wrestler. (laughs) You guys walk into a town or go into a bar. Hey, you're on television. People know this, that that's that where you're, you're literally living your gimmick 24 seven. Yeah. And that's what I was always told to do. And when I was Wolfie D, man, uh, that was me, man. And you know this, man. The, the guys that get over are the ones that just kind of live their gimmick. It's just an extension of themselves. And Wolfie D was actually me. And then when I did Slash, that was, I was, ooh, that was bad for me to live that gimmick. But right. at any rate, man. Um, yeah, but my so I said your favorite angle, moment in Memphis. If okay, you favorite moment. Moment. <laughs> or angle or time period. All right. I'll say, uh, how, wait, obviously, how, you say, how because we drew, we drew a lot of money. And that's not a term that's used anymore, but we drew money when we, st- first we started working Tommy Rich, Doug Gilbert, and that drew money. Then we went on to the rock and roll express where they did the smoky mountain invade USWA angle. And we kept adding people, Tracy Smothers, Buddy Landell, Terry Gordy, uh, the heavenly bodies, we kept adding people. And by the end of that, man, that it, it exploded. And, and we could not, quite frankly, that was the last big hurrah in Memphis before the final territory got took under. You know what I mean? Uh, and I, I feel so 
honored to be a part of that because when I started there in 93, they were about to go out of business. Uh, Jerry Jarrett brought us in, like I said, and, and, and we were undercard ha ha guys, right? Well, we left, we went to Mexico, we came back. Randy Hales was the booker at this point and gave us the push and the houses all came up, kept them in business. I mean, houses came up dramatically. We also had a little uh, help with WWF uh, because they were sending guys in to work with Lawler and stuff like that. But me, Jamie, uh, Brian Lawler, Tommy Rich, Doug Gilbert, uh, Billy Jack Haynes, we had a good crew, man. And uh, we we brought the houses up. and So uh, that was awesome. So I, I think the, the USWA Smoky Mountain thing was – one of my greatest memories are they the greatest matches I've ever had? No. And you probably know this. I bet you've had probably your greatest match is probably not even on tape. Is it? Mm, Yeah. Uh, I always say me and Christian at a house show uh, for the ECW title in friggin' Massachusetts. Yeah. uh, Where we, we put the, we didn't even put together the match. Everything called out there. We went like 25 minutes and I was just, yeah, Yeah, exactly. So there's things that, people say, who is your greatest opponent? Who? Da, da, da. It's different for every situation, yeah. right? Who'd you draw money with? Who'd you just have a good match with? You know, and then who do you like to work type thing? So there's, I can never answer that question of who is the the best person you ever worked. You know what I mean? Um, I don't remember Billy Jack Haynes being there. You don't remember Billy Jack Haynes, WrestleMania no, 3 I, versus Hercules? I know Billy Jack Haynes. Oh. You, you're talking Billy. You said Billy Jack Haynes. Are you talking Billy Joe Travis? Nope, I'm talking Billy Jack Haynes. He was in USWA, yeah, for a little bit. Wow, I don't remember this. In the, I think it was like 95, 96, he worked an angle with Brian Lawler. Nice. I have to now look this up. You have given me something to go down the YouTube wormhole tonight. Yeah, it's there, man. He, uh, I forget, it was a trophy, man, about fucking three to four foot tall that on the top of it had the little gimmick with the wings. And uh, that was the start of the angle. I'll never forget fucking Billy fucking hit Brian with that thing like a goddamn sword. It fucking broke the, the the wing gimmick off, but the wing fucking cut Brian all up like a motherfucker, man. Nice. That's what started the angle. And then, and then, okay, one of my favorite matches as a child was Billy Jack Hercules, uh, uh, WrestleMania three, one of my favorite matches as a kid. I watch it back now. It's still good though. Um, but anyway, uh, and then meeting him and I, you've met him, I'm sure. He, no, I've never met him. No bullshit. His laugh. Okay. You know how Billy looks? Uh, right. I mean, fuck. I remember as a kid that he was, uh, yeah, you know, wrestling little. sexiest man and pro wrestling illustrated, but then you meet him and he talks and he talks and he goes, he, <laughs> that's exactly how he laughs. And I thought that was the strangest thing ever. And now <laughs> that I see him like on some of these uh, YouTube gimmicks, man, it's lost his mind and it's, it's comical to me. Most of us do. <laughs> um, yeah. How do you get to the WWE? First a lot of people time, don't know uh, that you're, you're part of one of the bigger acts is the nation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but before that, we actually went up, uh, Lawler got us a shot, uh, on raw and it was back when they taped two shows a night. Mm-hmm. First show, uh, we have an interview and we have some job guys and we get a win with our finish. Next show, we wrestle the smoking guns for the titles two segment match, get beat, uh, still have an interview and stuff. And I'll tell you something pretty cool about that, man. I think you'll appreciate this. Um, We go up there and and they're pre-recording our uh, interviews, right? They've got all this shit written out on a fucking teleprompter. Dude, this was the first time I'd ever been in front of a teleprompter in my life. You know what I'm saying? You know, Memphis is is live TV and you go. So we tried it. (laughs) It was like for two takes. And me and Jamie, you know this, but we never one take guys, man. So we try it for like two takes and then we look at it and we said, listen, this is not what we would say um, and not the way we would say it. Can you tell us exactly, you know, give us a couple of points here that you want us to talk about or, you know, what do you want to get across and let us do it our own way? And they're like, "Mm -hmm." 
okay, well, well, all right, let's do it. So <laughs> fucking first take, boom. And if you watch it, uh, it's called 1995 PG-13 uh, debut. It's on YouTube. But anyway, uh, we nail it. And they start clapping. And <laughs> it's just like, really? I mean, this is what you're supposed every to do. Day. <laughs> yeah, this is what you're supposed to do. So anyway, uh, we do that. We have those matches. So what I understand, and here's, here's a little bit of story. Pritchard liked us. They all liked us. They loved the work. They loved the interview. But at that time, we were too small. Nowadays, we'd be <laughs> monsters. I, was, I met some of those AEW guys over the week, and it was like, <laughs> I was too small. But anyway, that was the deal, and that's why we didn't get the job right then. Cornette was the one that got us the Nation of Domination deal. Um, we were supposed to break off into a tag team um, after that concluded, but we self-destructed ourselves. I'll leave it at that. Uh, Jamie had told me, well, uh, awesome story. Um, you guys flew into somewhere. I want to mm -hmm. say either New York, New York or Hartford, but mm -hmm. the show was in Boston area. And I know where you're going. <laughs> and you I know where you're going. To take a cab? This, no, no, no. That's a little bit off. A okay. little bit off. Okay. So this <laughs> this is what happened. And you got to lead up to this. Him, at one point in time, Tommy, me and Jamie were working for Memphis, ECW, and WWF all at the same time. Wow. We would just do Mondays for WWF or Sundays if there was a pay-per-view. Uh, Monday through Thursday, USWA. Friday, Saturday, we come up there and work with you guys most weeks. So he's up all night. He misses his flight into Boston. And we're in, how do you say it? Wooster? Wooster, yes. Yes. So think about how much a cab ride from the airport to Wooster costs, right? So Jamie misses his flight. He takes a cab. Dude, it's like fucking five o'clock before he ever shows up at the building. Hands the receipt to Jim Ross and says, tell Vince to take care of this. <laughs> yeah so that then, was about it <laughs> so then he passes out in the dressing room our music's playing the nation's getting ready to go to the ring you know we did that rap live i go to find him and he's in the dressing room passed out and davy boy and owen had put fucking shaving cream all over him so i had to pick him up music's playing had to pick him up put him in the shower rinse him off and basically carry him to the ring and rap by myself Wow. <laughs> so that was well, the story. And I remember him telling me it's hit when they were like, we're not going to pay this. And it says, you said in my contract, and he goes, and I have my contract here that it <laughs> says you have to pay my transportation to the event. <laughs> and uh, yeah. well, I can tell you, he didn't get that money. I promise you. <laughs> and I was, there goes the nation of domination run. Right. Um, Squashed by the road warriors the next week. <laughs> All right. So then WWE, w ECW, now uh, you're kind of, you and Jamie kind of go your separate ways. Yeah. And then uh, we have you alone and this thing called TNA starts. It's also in your backyard. And uh, so you have another run in the business. Yeah. In TNA. Yeah. Uh, Jeff <laughs> made me uh, sign a thing of silence. Uh, when he first came up with that idea, I actually, um, cause I'm good at graphic design or I used to be, I really don't mess with it no more, but I'm a good artist. And, uh, I was actually making the tickets, the, uh, the paper, uh, for those events when they first started, I was on the first show, you know, he called me about it and everything, but the actual run, because, and, and me and Jeff are cool. Like I said, I mean, he gave us our first break, him and his daddy. And then this was him and his daddy again, give me another little run. But Jeff has always thought of me as, uh, as a carpenter. You know what I mean? He's never really thought of me as, I, I don't think, I mean, he might say different, but I, I just think he's always thought of me as not the person that could get over, or, you know, right. get to that level or whatever like that. So <clears throat> the thing was, uh, at first, it was me, 
Jim Mitchell. It was me and Jim Mitchell the whole time. Uh, but then they kept giving me different partners because of whatever reason. To me, that was a, uh, you know, a compliment. Hey, this tag team wrestler, and fuck, he just needs somebody that can help him here. You know what I mean? And uh, so it was, it was sin. It was Brian Lee. And Brian Lee was the one that me and him clicked. We didn't, we clicked almost on a level of me and Jamie, but it, it was very close. It was very close. Me and Brian clicked. And it was, they were going to put the titles on us uh, against James Storm, whom I trained, and Chris Harris, America's Most Wanted. Uh, they were going to put the titles on us just for like a week and take them right back. But they saw something there, and it started working. Uh, so we kind of went in and out for a little bit. And, and then they had us do uh, – We the people kept chanting, evil, evil. We were heels, but they were starting to get with us. That's about the time that Russo came in. I don't think he knew what to do with us. They're chanting evil, your heels. Okay, let's make a baby face and wrestle Raven and Mike Awesome and all the uh, ECW guys for this, the, you know, invasion thing or whatever. And that worked for a little bit. But in 2004, uh, when they went to Orlando, I, my contract uh, up until that point was we're going to guarantee you this amount of dates at this amount of money. By the end of 2004, when they were going to Orlando, they had not honored all of my dates. So I said, Hey, <laughs> um, I'm going to need this little bit of money. You owe me right here. And so that caused a little problem. Uh, it, maybe even with me and Jeff, but like I said, I just saw him the other day and we're cool as cucumbers, but <clears throat> I told him, I said, man, if you don't give me my money, I'm fucking getting a lawyer. You know what I mean? I, I had yeah. to go that route with it. So I think after that is why I didn't go with them. And it got bigger after, after Nashville. And then they brought it, me and uh, sin in for one of those uh, one night only pay-per-views and I fucking hated it. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm on pay-per-view Try <laughs> Al Snow calls me. He says, Wolfie, uh, we're doing a reunion type thing. You and sin, uh, can you be here? And it was like, I think it was like four to six weeks out. And I was fucking hurt, man. I'm like, I don't remember what happened, but I was fucking hurt. I was literally in the bed when he called me. And uh, I said, Al, I said, I'm beat the fuck up, man. I said, I don't think I can be ready by then. And uh, okay, we hang up. Well, <laughs> I sat there and I thought, you know what? This is going to probably be my last fucking shot at something. You know what I mean? Uh, this was like 2013. And I said, this is probably my last shot. So I called him back. I said, Al, I'll fucking be there. Are you sure? I said, yes, I'm sure. So I fucking like two a days at the gym and everything. We get there, man. And uh, we work LAX. Um, uh, what's their names? What's their names? Uh, Hernandez and... And uh, Homicide. Homicide. Yes. And Homicide can work. Homicide's old school. He can work. Man, we didn't talk to them. And I could just feel this vibe at that year in that company was just... Ugh. You know what I mean? I, yeah. I'm there like, hey, I'm going to try to open some eyes and get my job back. These guys didn't give a fuck. I didn't talk to them, I swear to God, till about uh, 20 minutes before we went to the ring on pay-per-view. So it's not what I wanted, but whatever. That's how that worked out. Uh, I remember seeing you on an indie. We were, you know, we're friends. We're also like, man, you're in good shape. I remember how hard you were working. And uh, I booked you on my show uh, for House Hardcore. You tore oh. your tricep. <laughs> yeah, that that was. You literally tore your tricep the night before. Oh, because, okay, I tore this one partially. Right. This one, I don't know if you can see the scar, but I actually had to have surgery. There's no way that I did because that's this was 2016. Uh, yeah, I, I tore this completely off the bone doing a fucking fez press. <laughs> I was going to say you got hit with a bunch of injuries later on in your career. Yeah. Um, the best part about you when I had seen you, you were like, you know, different person. And I mean, you're clean and sober. You uh, mm -hmm. you really embraced your sobriety and you were really, really, you know, talking heavy about that stuff, getting your act together. Unfortunately, right. you had a few injuries. But I mean, you're 
a lot of our friends are no longer with us because they right. can't do that stuff. So, I mean, that that's important, important for, for anybody because as you get old, older. You, you oh, I had a, life. did you know I had a heart attack last year? No. Yeah, man. I was, uh, me and my girl were going to Gatlinburg. We didn't have the kids for the weekend. So we're going to go to Gatlinburg. I live in Somerset, Kentucky now. About a two, two and a half hour drive, something like that. In going that way, because I have to, that's where I picked my son up at uh, on the way to Gatlinburg. He lives in Maribel and me and his mother meet halfway. So I, I go this route a lot. There's a liquor store and it's called, it's in uh, like in wood. And it says, it's like, it looks like a log cabin. It says stone cold liquor store. So I keep telling my girl and my girl wrestled a little bit in, independent wise. And I said, we have got to stop here one day and do a little skit in front of it. So this day it was sunny. Cause usually it was like raining or snowing or something. Every time we went by it, well, we stop. And uh, so we do this little skit. I get a, uh, a bang energy drink, put it in a um, paper sack. Like it's a beer. And we do it in front of the sign, and I'm look, 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 look. hell yeah, <laughs> it's the Stone Cold Liquor Store, blah, 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 blah. And then she walks into the scene, you're not supposed to be fucking drinking, we got to drive, we're going to Gatlinburg. Last time I checked, you wasn't my mom, you were my girlfriend. And then she kicks me, gives me the fucking stunner, I take a big bump, <laughs> spit the shit out, right? All right, so get back in the car, headed to Gatlinburg. I start having these pains. Like it felt like gas. That's what I thought it was. Get on down the road, man. Probably about 30 minutes. And I said, baby, I'm going to pull over at this gas station. I said, go in there and get me some gas pills. Pull over. She goes in. I get out the car, man. Cause all of a sudden I just start sweating. I just start sweating. And I get out of the car, put my hands on the, the roof and just kind of lean over all of a sudden I got dizzy and bro, I took the fucking flare bump boom, right in the parking lot of this gas station, man, busting my head all up. I did not have to be resuscitated. I got up myself. There was like probably six people around me. Two of them were uh, EMTs and a nurse, EMT and a nurse. So there are people running there, getting me aspirin and blah, blah, blah. They call the ambulance. My girl don't know really where we are. So it was kind of a a thing trying to get them there. But, dude, it felt like somebody was stabbing me in the heart with a fucking screwdriver, man. I just leaned up against my back tire, my rear back tire, while the ambulance came. Scary as shit. Once I got in the ambulance, I felt safer just because I knew they could probably save me. You know what I mean? And they took me to Knoxville. We were about 20 minutes outside of Knoxville to the hospital, straight into surgery, put two stents in my heart and that shit hurt like a motherfucker. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's what happened. Wow. I didn't know any of that. Um, yeah. well, I'm glad you're here. Yeah, man. Uh, I'm glad, uh, life is okay for you. Yeah. We are it's still tolerable. Here. Yeah. <laughs> um, you also have a podcast, correct? I do. I do. It is on, uh, any platform that you listen to podcasts live and in color with Wolfie D, my co-host is Jimmy Street. Man, we we do pretty good. Um, you know, talk about a lot of Memphis, but I also have a lot of guests on too. Um, trying How to get you, on, you on social media. Uh, social media, uh, you can go to my personal website, but it's uh, it's loaded up. So getting to be a friend is like a waiting list of people delete themselves or whatever. But that's at Warren Wolf. And then uh, Wolfie D, obviously, I have a Facebook on there. Uh, Live and in color, Wolfie D has a Facebook. Um, And then on Twitter, live, uh, I forget what he put it as, live in color, Wolfie D, something on Twitter and and Instagram and all that shit. Well, I think it's going to have to be a part two because uh, I wanted to talk more about like, Bill Dundee pulling a knife on you, <laughs> yeah. some other good stuff, but uh, yeah. I don't want to take up too much of your time. So uh, we'll definitely have to get a part two of this. Plus I have to come on your show and do your podcast. Yeah. So it's uh, I'm going to end it here with, I'm happy you're clean and sober. I'm happy uh, we're alive and well, and yeah. uh, we're not doing our thing that we used to do, but we're still doing our thing. And that's being alive and, 
you know, just uh, enjoying life and kids and all that stuff. Normal Sorry. stuff. Who'd you I, ever be? Sorry. Never. I'm still trying to get some. <laughs> it was good seeing hey, you, buddy. Hey, you too, buddy. Thank you. I'll talk to you.